Klaus from the Plastic Club Concordia in Vienna. Welcome to today's conversation with Gerard Rai. Hello, Gerard. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's great. Uh, Gerard is the man behind Panama Paradise and Pandora Papers and many more investigations. We will hear about that and we will also have the opportunity to ask in a Q&A session. Uh, Panama and Pandora, as you all know, are the biggest journalistic investigations in history. Uh, but there are many more with huge impact led by the ICIJ, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, where uh, Gerard is the director. I'm Daniela Kraus, I'm the general director, uh, general, <laughs> general secretary of Press Club Concordia in Vienna, which is the oldest press club in the world. Uh, and this seminar is a cooperation with the Forum for Journalism and Media in Vienna. Hello. Um, uh, we host a series of seminars together for journalists and academics, and it's so great to have you all here again. Um, our series of seminars is also moderated by the fantastic Miriana Tomic, uh, who will also moderate today's event. Hello, Miriana. Hello, Daniela. Uh, the conversation uh, between Gerard and Miriana will be followed by a Q&A. And please, uh, you have to know that this event is also, uh, we are also streaming and recording. So welcome to all our listeners and viewers uh, in the stream. Well, and that's it from my side because I am really looking forward to listen to you, Gerard. So I keep my introduction very short. Miriana will say some words and introduce you. Uh, and, and yeah, I hand over to Miriana. The Zoom, is, the Zoom is yours. Thank you very much, Daniela. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, it is my true honor today to have uh, Gerard Ryle as a guest and interlocutor. As Daniela says, uh, he, uh, said, he is the director of International Consortium of Investigative Journalism, the man behind Pandora, Panama Paradise Papers, and many other uh, investigations and impact, to only mention a few that he oversaw. Gerard is Irish, but he developed most of his journalistic career in Australia, and he is the first non-American to head ICIJ, and we shall now post his uh, CV in the chat. When mentioning uh, ICIJ and mega investigations, or better said, revelations, one always mentions that hundreds of journalists in just as many countries are involved and cooperate. Among them, the recent Nobel Prize uh, winner, Maria Reza, the celebrated Filipino journalist who is part of the consortium. Uh, when the revelations of Panama Papers were made public in 2016, based on a leak uh, involve, uh, involving more than 11 million uh, financial and legal records uh, uh, stemming from um, uh, firm, uh, Fonseca, law firm Fonseca in Panama, this uh, international uh, investigation was called the biggest in history. Panama documents combined uh, one year of reporting and revealed how 140 politicians, as well as celebrities, uh, drug dealers, uh, alleged, alleged arms traffickers, and global elites obscured their wealth. This is a quote from the ICIJ website. Pandora Papers, as uh, uh, Jared recently said, are Panama Papers on steroids. While Panama Papers came from one source, Pandora documents came from 14 different source, uh, uh, service providers in, uh, uh, in uh, different jurisdictions, including the United States as a, a tax haven. Uh, Pandora Papers investigation is uh, uh, a lot bigger than Panama, millions of leaked documents and the uh, biggest journalism partnership in history. Uh, Jared, I have so many questions and I'm sure that the audience uh, has even more. And uh, I will divide my questions into three groups since most of our, but not all of our participants are journalists. I will uh, uh, divide my questions into three groups. One will, how does this system work? The second will be the financial matters and the third will be the impact. Uh, so uh, ICIJ uh, focuses on corruption and on its website, one can find uh, numerous methods uh, how one can drop information. What if someone uh, has information and does not know you? How do they, uh, where do they drop information? What is the usual procedure or is there one? Who is the first who gets information? Is the ICIJ or the partners? 
Will you just start introducing a bit how you actually work, the mechanism of it? Thank you so much, Jared. Yeah, sure. Look, and, and thank you for having me. I really appreciate the chance to talk about our work because it's important, because we actually do rely on the public to keep going. Um, we're a nonprofit. We're based in Washington, D.C. And look, what we do is we actually find what we think are really good global stories. And there can be anything from financial stories to medical stories, to food security, to the World Bank, looking at any worldwide institutions. We see ourselves as kind of a global watchdog. Um, what we do is we find the story and then we bring the story to media partners around the world. And in return for working with us, they've got to give us their reporters. So even though the reporters continue to work for the media organizations, they work under the direction of ICIJ. In other words, to one common goal, which is the eventual deadline for the story itself. Um, so I tend to work and I've learned, like I started doing this 10 years ago and when I started I was almost laughed out of every newsroom that I approached because I was approaching editors and saying, hey, let's all collaborate on stories. Let's build this great big international newsroom. And the major newspapers I went to oh, just said, Look, why would we want to do that? This is crazy. It'll never work. And we've already got our own resources. But when I started, it was also a period when the media itself was going through a bit of a transition. You know, the, the business models that were funding journalism were, were, were changing. They were all starting to suffer financially and they began to, they were being forced to really think of new ways of doing things. And also it came at a time when technology was changing. You know, 10 years ago when I started doing this, it cost a lot of money to ring internationally. Now we all use apps that are free of charge. We, we knew that we could use um, technology better. That was one of the things that really drove me in this. I had been an investigative reporter for 25 years, as you said, in Australia. I kept asking my company there to invest in building databases because I believe that data is the basis of all stories, doesn't matter where it comes from, and, and they weren't listening. And I was saying, well, we really should be building for the future here. Instead of being afraid of technology, let's use the technology to change journalism itself. Um, I landed at ICIJ, as I said, 10 years. It was four people in a basement in DC. And really the model that you're seeing now came out of necessity. It wasn't that I had some genius idea. It was, it was the only way I could think of actually getting any resources to do investigative reporting because we were a tiny nonprofit with no money. I had went from running a newspaper with a hundred reporters, you know, graphic artists, photographers, all those kind of resources you're expecting to nothing literally. And so I just thought, well, I have to change the model of ICIJ, which was really just a journalism network if I'm going to do investigative reporting, let's try something new. So it began small and built up. I think our first project was eight reporters and with three media partners. Um, our biggest hit at the time, I think, was in 2013, two years later, when I managed to persuade about 42 media partners to come together to do a story. It was actually about offshore as well. And that really led me you know, to, I had a lot of basically lessons in that. I did everything wrong at the beginning. So if anyone thinks that this all worked from the beginning, it doesn't work. Um, you know, I thought we got a big data set I actually brought with me from Australia. And I thought what I'll do is I'll bring reporters to various hubs around the world, give them access to documents, and then they'll go home to their home countries and they'll write stories. I quickly realized that that doesn't work. They came, they saw, they didn't have enough time to find the stories and they certainly didn't weren't able to consult the documents afterwards for fact checking and other things. So the big lesson there for me was you've got to put everything in the cloud. You've got to give every reporter every document from their home computer at all times. So how do we overcome that? That's something we did manage to overcome. Um, the other lesson I learned from doing the very first investigation I did at ICIJ when we found this really terrific story about human body parts and how they were being traded around the world. And I went to the Washington Post with the story. It was a terrific story because these products were being manufactured in America and the human bodies were being obtained in Ukraine, were going via Germany to the US and being turned into products by companies traded on Wall Street. That was a terrific story. But the Washington Post told me, how can I trust any of this reporting? We weren't involved in it. You're coming to us at the end. So that's where I learned you need to involve reporters from the very beginning if you're going to, if these media partners are going to trust the reporting. And it was lucky because obviously then they were the two key lessons to learn. You know, you don't go to editors, you go to reporters, um, you make, you know, you use technology and you bring everyone with you along the way. Um, and, and that's really where it's the, the, the germination of where we started. We did um, 
project after project. Some of them you might remember, some you might not. We did, you know, LuxLeaks was a very big project in Europe. We did, we did Swiss Leaks, we did China Leaks, um, we did the FinCEN files, we did the implant files. And then of course, in 2016, we did Panama Papers, which was really our, you know, our big breakthrough because everyone remembers that after we published that, um, the leader of Iceland resigned within 24 hours, which gave us a real kick along. And then eventually it brought down three world leaders, led to law changes in about 50 different countries. I think it gave um, back taxes. I think uh, tax offices around the world investigated the names we published after Panama Papers and recovered about $1.4 billion. So we really put this whole idea of a new kind of journalism on the map, which is not international reporting as I see it. I see this is a kind of a new type of reporting. It's really global reporting where you're getting all the reporters to work as a team, to share information. It's the opposite of everything we know as investigative reporters. I mean, I was an investigative reporter for years and I wouldn't share it with my next door neighbor. I wouldn't share it with my, you know, the reporter next to me because, you know, you're very secretive, you're a lone wolf. Um, we kind of, again, have changed that model where we now teach reporters that if you share with your colleagues, you will actually end up with a much better and deeper, um, deep, more deeply reported story. Um, how we work now after learning all those lessons is really quite simple. We have, um, we build our own technology. So about half of our team are technologists or data journalists. So I have about 10 computer programmers who create terrific technology that allows us to collaborate on a, in a pretty secure way. So we have two main platforms. Our, our main thing to ingest documents like, like this, where we're dealing with 12 million odd documents in all sorts of formats. You know, you're talking about spreadsheets, emails, PDFs, photographs, other things. We are able now to ingest all those relatively quickly into our own system called DataShare, which we built actually with the help of a grant from the postcode lottery in Sweden. And they gave us a million dollars to build it. And, um, and it, it's terrific. Basically, you can query very, in a very sophisticated way these documents. You can put what you call batch searches through. So you can have every member of, of your parliament and their families and their children and everything in names. And you can put that through a spreadsheet and get hits pretty quickly. Because one thing you learn when you're doing this kind of work is that the documents themselves are really just the beginning of a very long process. You've got to... Um, go outside the documents to verify them. You've got to put context around them. You very rarely come across a document that you can just sit down and read and write a story from it. You've got to put a lot of context around it, which is why these things take so long. Um, so data share allows a reporter to work from home or anywhere they want in the world using any kind of technology because we're also very conscious that we work in Africa and Asia. Um, we sometimes have reporters who are working with cracked screens on their phone. And they've only got internet two hours a day. They've got to be able to access in a, in a safe and secure manner, the same way as somebody from, say, the New York Times with, you know, fantastic internet and all the technology in the world. So when we work as a team, everybody's equal and everyone can learn from everybody else. But everyone, there's no one member of the team that has more rights than the other. Um, so data share basically allows them to look at everything. The rules of ICIJ is if you see your prime minister, or if you see somebody important in your country, you've got to let everybody know. And where that happens is that on another platform called the iHub. And this is like an online newsroom that we've built. Um, and it's a little bit like Facebook for journalists. You go on there, you can see in this, in, in Pandora, we had something like, we had more than 600 reporters working with us in the end. So you could see all 600 reporters, where they were from, whether they were live. If they're live on our platform, you get a green light. If they're not live, you know they're not there, but you can communicate securely with them. Um, and there is where you start gathering what will eventually be the stories. So if you say, are looking at the Pandora papers and you see sports stars and you notice that they're putting their offshore their image rights into offshore companies, which became one of the stories. You, you say, hey, I've just noticed this Argentinian star of this Brazilian star or this Spanish sports star, and this is what he's doing. And then someone else comes along and say, I've noticed another name, same thing. So you start gathering around the topics that are of interest to you. Um, another example with Pandora was we noticed that um, somebody who had been convicted of looting art in Southeast Asia was in there. And we started building a whole topic around that person, which eventually became a really terrific story about how art was being looted through 
um, and the money was going through offshore accounts around the world. You know, other examples would be we started noticing world leaders in there. In fact, we ended up with 35 current and former world leaders in the documents. Politicians was another group that started. And, and people are communicating in their own language as well as you know, main, the main language you use is English, but if there's a big Spanish group there, they all start talking in Spanish and so forth and so on. Um, they also help each other. You know, if you need a document from Brazil, you have a colleague in Brazil who's going to help you. Um, one other factor about building a successful collaboration like this is not to have any rivalry. So it would be impossible, for instance, for us to have the New York Times and the Washington Post on the same project because the competition is too much. So what we try and do is build a newspaper, a radio station and a TV station for each country if we can. Like sometimes there are two newspapers, but they, they are people that we've worked with before and we know they're not going to break the embargo because the, one of the most important things is that we have to keep this secret the entire time. So we started Pandora Papers two years before we ended up publishing. And we had let the media partners in about a year and a half. We started letting them in about a year and a half before publication. So there's a long time where they've got to keep a secret. And we need to bring in people that we can trust. Um, the May biggest... I interrupt you right yeah, there? Yeah, How yeah. do you build uh, this trust? Uh, we uh, journalists know there is a, a, a race for a scoop. But there is another factor as well. How do you build this trust among so many uh, journalists? You said in one interview that uh, your network includes both uh, uh, media like the New York Times and uh, freelance journalists or one man or one woman show. Well, the economic disparity between New York Times and one man or one woman show in Africa or East Europe is big. How do you finance, uh, uh, how does it work for people on the ground? Who pays them? Uh, yeah. I don't mean the operation, that is one question. How do you build trust? It's another question. And the third one is, you mentioned at the beginning, and I would like you to explain who really uh, decides on everything. Is it uh, the ICIJ that tells this is the topic or someone brings in the topic or you decide, you know, 600 people, uh, deciding together is uh, not that uh, easy. Yeah, well, look, we bring the story. So initially, you know, I got a hold of the documents. I thought they were of interest. Uh, I, I think initially I got about 5 million of them. Um, and eventually it did build up over time into what we finally got. Well, it took about a year to get the rest of the documents. But when I had the first 5 million, I spent two weeks researching the documents after they'd been ingested into data share. And I just went home and sat through Christmas reading them all, looking for things of public interest, because I thought that was what I needed to do. Um, and also to convince our lawyer that we were going to be able to do this project, because you cannot, um, you know, if, if things were, if these were just private records of ordinary people of no public interest, then there was no story there. So it was up to me to really find the first um, set of politicians and, and other public figures, which, which is pretty easy to do, actually. It was like shooting fish in a barrel with these, these documents. It wasn't that hard to do. And I ended up writing a 3,000 word memo that went to our lawyer. And once he had signed off on the project, I was able to then go to media partners. I was also looking in the early stages too for how many countries we might have had interest uh, documents for, because obviously the, the, the value of this is to um, is to have something unique for each country. Otherwise, what, they wouldn't have any interest in joining the project. Um, so in this case, we decided the project because it was a really good one. Sometimes they come to us from media partners. I mean, we had an example of a, of a media partner approaches about a report that, that he had seen from one of his colleagues in Holland. And, um, and this reporter, she had gone out and bought a bag of mandarin oranges and she had thrown away the mandarins and she had registered the, or she at least tried to register the, the plastic bag as a medical device in Europe. And that led to a big story we did on, on the lack of regulation of medical devices. And, you know, with the Pandora or the Panama Papers, for instance, that the, the main set of documents came from one of the media companies we've been working with on previous projects. Um, and that leads me to your other question, how do you build up trust? You build up trust by doing it. Um, we started doing it small, and then every time we did another project, we would work with people that we knew we could trust. If we came across a media company or a person or a journalist that we knew wasn't to be trusted and you know, they weren't playing by the rules, we just wouldn't work with them again. And so I come from a really big family in Ireland, there's like nine of us. 
and you learn that basically the, the, the older children teach the younger children the rules of the game. And that's what happened here. Everyone we worked with before um, were, would teach through peer pressure. The other is that, hey, this really does work. You know, With Pandora, for instance, we were working with some of the reporters from the Washington Post for the first time. And I had to give a counseling session to one of them at the beginning because she just couldn't get, her, get over the idea of having to share what she was seeing with other people. And I had to say, look, trust me, it's going to work. You just have to let go. We have to let go of everything you've, you've learned as an investigative reporter and lean into this. And eventually she ended up with a, a terrific story because everybody was doing the same thing. They were also sharing with her. And so after a while, it's like you have, suddenly you have 600 colleagues that are all helping you with your story. Um, it hasn't always worked, by the way. We've, we have been let down in the past by media partners and it does really breach trust when it happens. But again, my rule is if that happens with you know, a media partner, we, we simply never invite them again. And we have a track record now of finding these stories. So people do want to work with us. So there is an incentive for them to play by the rules. And also they see what happens at the end. I mean, when we publish together on the same day, there's a massive firestorm across the world and you get uh, uh, reactions and, you know, and follow-up stories that you wouldn't get if you had kept that story to yourself. Um, I understand. Uh, uh, what, uh, one thing is, how do you select the partners? Do you have advisors? You know, uh, I don't know how many languages you speak, but you know, there are all these local languages, et cetera. Uh, the, how do you select partners? And if some of your, uh, some people of journalists in your network who work in non-democratic countries, and they are quite a few of them, uh, mm -hmm. if they have problems, if they have to leave the country, do you have a safety net? Uh, do you help them get out? Uh, if they get out, uh, do you help, uh, does the organization help them in any way? Is we there some uh, system, yeah. a mechanism? Yeah, we do try to help them behind the scenes, but we also stay within our lane. We are a journalistic organization. We don't do press freedom. We're not an advocacy group, so we don't do advocacy. We would steer them towards, you know, reporters without borders or committed to big journalists if they needed help. Um, we are very careful not to just just to do what we're doing. We're, we literally we do journalism. We are a story driven organization. We do not take money to do stories. We're also very clear on that. Um, we just basically want to find a really great story and then do it on a, in a global way. And so everything we do is around that. How we find media partners is mainly by working with reporters. You know, I'll give you an example of, you know, one of the biggest stories in Panama Papers was the um, Icelandic prime minister. And we had never worked with anybody in Iceland before. We'd, we'd had a number of reporters write to us um, wanting to work with us, but because we had no local knowledge, we really didn't know who to choose. So for there, we went to our Swedish media partners and we'd worked with them multiple times in the past. And they recommended Johannes Christensen. They said he was a, a reporter. And we really needed somebody in Iceland who would keep a secret because of course there we had the prime minister um, and we needed that we weren't ready to publish for a year. And therefore we needed to have somebody who would keep a secret for a year. I mean, and we, you know, Iceland's 300,000 people, everybody knows each other you know, uh, they're all related in some way, or at least they certainly are neighbors, or they would know somebody, or they would know somebody who knows somebody. So like Johannes really had to sacrifice a lot. Um, and I guess this goes to your question, who pays people? We don't pay anybody. Now, we only pay our own reporters in, the, you know, in, in Washington, and we have like people in about six countries at ICIJ. The 600 reporters working on Pandora Papers were all paid for by their own companies. That is the, the beauty of this little model where we, a really tiny nonprofit can build a big international newsroom for relatively nothing. It doesn't cost us anything. Um, uh, but it also, it, it's important in another way in that we're not responsible for what they publish, which is very important when it comes to defamation or if they get something wrong. Um, they take the responsibility themselves. But with Johannes, I mean, he literally gave up all work for a year. He lived on the earnings of his wife. You know, he had to endure the barbs and, and people saying that he was a good for nothing, wasn't working because he couldn't tell anybody he was working secretly on the story. And then of course, when the story came out, you know, it, it was worth it for him, but it was a big sacrifice. And a lot of these reporters, especially in small countries and freelancers, they really do 
do a lot for the story. They're, they're not working for ICIJ, they're working for themselves, but they're working for journalism and they're working to do the journalism. We give them the opportunity to do that journalism, but um, they have to decide themselves how they want to do it. You know, we go to the Guardian or the BBC, they make all the decisions as to what's important in their own countries. But remember along the way, they're sharing with all their colleagues, their findings. So it doesn't matter how country specific that finding is, um, and it, you, you'd be surprised at how many stories that start off as a country specific story end up being a global story because someone else says, hey, that's happening in my country too. And then someone else says it's happening here too. And then suddenly you've got a cluster of journalists that are now all talking about this particular topic that they thought was really only something that they were seeing themselves in their own country. So it, it's a terrific way of, of working and the technology allows you to, um, to wake up every morning if you're interested in a topic we have a, a function on our system that allows you to click a button and then everybody who comments or says they're interested in that topic, every finding they make is automatically emailed to you. So you, you know, and I've worked as an investigative reporter where, you know, it's really lonely. You know, you, you might find one thing one day and then a, something else a week later, it's very hard to, to maintain the enthusiasm for the story. Here, it's, it's terrific. You wake up every morning and there are like 20 emails on the topic that you're interested in, 20 new leads to do. You know, it's, it's a great way of keeping your morale up as you go through this, what is really long distance running of journalism. I so, understand and, you yeah. have a virtual uh, newsroom. That's what I'm, yeah, that's our iHub. Yeah, that's where you get to see all your reporters and that's where the reporters when they see something of interest, they tell everybody else. So, you know, but it's also like very sophisticated because we have set up automatic email alerts for things that you're, you know, that might be of interest to you. And, and so you're able to, I mean, sometimes by the end of a project or coming to the end, it's almost impossible to keep up with all the leads that people are finding, but it's a, it's a terrific way of like getting excitement going and keeping morale up. Is there anybody who coordinates it all or you just enter the newsroom and you see who, uh, who is dealing with the stories of your interest? Is there any manager who manages, any editor, any boss? Yeah, yeah there's a, there's a full-time managing editor at ICIJ, Fergus Scheel. He is the person who manages it. He, he brings everybody in. So if you need to join the project, you go to him. Um, he lets you into the system. He, um, he actually emails everybody on a regular basis all the way through all the findings. So he summarizes the findings because the other thing you, you know, not everyone is working every day. Not everyone can work for a year on a project. And so it's, it's very, one of the biggest dangers in working with these big projects is that you become quickly lost in the, you drown in the number of, in the amount of material that's, that's available on, on our online newsroom. And so what Fergus does also as part of his job is he summarizes regularly the findings. So you can then, if you don't have time to read everything, you can at least read a summary of what people are seeing and what, what they're doing. And Fergus doesn't sleep because there are all these time zones. He literally doesn't sleep, yeah. And near the end, he must be working 14, 15 hours a day. But it's really important to have one person to go to at all times and one person to... It's also important for us too at ICIJ because we're also a newsroom member. We're not just a coordination organization. We don't just bring the story. We do the reporting as well. So what we're looking for in, with my team is we're like a magazine. We, we, we pick stories to do that will benefit everybody. So if there's like profiles of world leaders that we know everyone's going to use or profiles of them, in this case, we had 14 offshore service providers where the documents came from. So we would do 14 mini profiles of them. If we, we, you know, we wanted to do a story on, on how big law firms were writing legislation in offshore jurisdictions and then bringing their clients to those jurisdictions to take advantage of the laws that they were writing. A story like that, we would also do. So we're a bit like an AP or a Reuters. So before every single project, we um, make available all of our reporting to all of our media partners in advance of publication so that they can use our stories if they want to, again, without taking responsibility for their publications. So we will always try and find stories that, you know, to save them time, you know, things that we know everyone will need for the project. And, and then, you know, and we're obviously, you know, we do the global story too, because that's, that's our, you know, while they're doing a British story or a Brazilian story or a Kenyan story, we're doing the global story. So there's a lot of stories that, I mean, we, 
we're lucky because we have 600 researchers working for us for free. Uh, well, I'll have to speed up because uh, half an hour, this is fascinating. We'll just come to finances. I understand you have to canvas every, every year about $5 million to keep the uh, system running. And uh, most of your time or half of your time is taken by, uh, 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 by this activity. That's what I'm doing now. I'm in the middle of a, or starting a six week tour of, of the world trying to raise money. It's really, really hard to raise money for this because people don't want to fund it. Um, a lot of the reasons there, are why, they scared yeah. they will be on your next, next list? Yeah, the people that will fund this or could fund this are rich people and rich people don't like what we do. Um, it's as simple as that. Um, we get most of our money from foundations. So, or from lotteries. I mentioned the postcode lottery in Sweden gives us money. We also get money from the postcode lottery in Holland. Um, we rely, you know, we rely on charity. Uh, you know, people, I think we got um, a lot of small donations now after Pandora Papers. If you want to donate to, our, to us, please go to our website. Please donate. We shall, uh, yeah, we shall yeah, post yeah, at yeah, the end uh, yeah. on our chat yeah. the link for donations yeah. that, uh, yeah. you know, our colleagues can also share. But it's uh, really, it's been really hard for us because we've had two years of COVID. And unless you're able to travel and see people, it's really, really difficult to get them to give you money. Um, so, I, you know, I tend to do um, events or just go and see people. What I'll be doing now for six weeks nonstop is literally going and, and trying to raise money for the next project. And that is- Which country has yeah. been the most generous? Um, I would say Holland and the US are the two most generous to us over the years. So yeah, they've been pretty good. It's been really hard to get money elsewhere, um, mainly because journalism per se is not a tax deductible thing, except in the US. So it's very hard to get money. Um, yeah, it's, it's just really hard. Again, because people don't fully understand or appreciate what it is we do or understand the value of what we do. I mean, I, I see this as like, I see certainly see all of our work on offshore, you know, as, Really, it's about inequity. We're really reporting on inequity. We're not talking about people avoiding taxes. Yeah, sure, I know that's part of it, but this is the biggest driver of inequity ever. And it's also the biggest you know, undermining of democracy ever. You know, I mean, almost every corruption um, incident you can think of, whether it be in Austria or anywhere else, it all comes down to secrecy and, and people, us ordinary people, not knowing what's going on. And I think if you can, drive you know uh, stories against secrecy then you're really doing a public service and that's what drives us i mean we really really believe in the journalism we're doing and we believe that journalism should be relevant and and i think that's what you know that's why i took this job 10 years ago i felt that what i was doing uh, you know working for a newspaper a big newspaper it we, we weren't doing stories that were relevant to the public anymore and therefore you need to find a new medium and this is a yeah, you know, it's hard to do it this way, but we can certainly have a huge impact. And it is a way of doing the kind of journalism that I think all journalists should be doing, but you just don't get a chance. Well, it uh, leads me to the last topic. I'll just, I'll, uh, I'll go quickly. And that is the impact and, uh, of what you do. Uh, you mentioned it at some point uh, that this whole corruption, uh, the amount of uh, money involved in corruption and in really in dealing, sorry if I'm not using a professional term, uh, it's almost like shadow economy. Do you have any estimate of how much money are we talking about? We don't, we honestly don't know. We're talking trillions and trillions of dollars. I have seen estimates once that a third of all world wealth and half of all world trade goes through the offshore economy now, which means that you're really looking at, um, you know, at trillions of dollars. And I would also add to that is that all, nearly all corruption now goes through the offshore world because they're selling a product and it's one product only, and that is secrecy. And where you have secrecy, you always have the potential for corruption. And we need to, and well, I think we need to sort of constantly campaign against this because I can't see any actual purpose to the offshore world other than to keep secrets. And you know, we are talking about the impact of the story. I mean, within the first week, we had proposed new legislation in the US where they're basically uh, trying to eliminate the enablers of the system, which are the big, big banks, the big accountancy firms, the big law firms. They're now campaigning, uh, hopefully we'll have new laws there that will stop that. And when you have laws in the US, it tends to reverberate around the world. So it's good from that point of view. 
um, we were credited with bringing down the prime minister of the Czech Republic. He was facing an election two days after we published. He was not expected to lose an election. He did. Um, the Chilean um, president is, has been impeached. Um, it looks like the Ecuadorian president could also fall. Um, uh, I mean, you know, in terms of impact, I think there was $80 million seized in Australia. Um, some of the artwork that I talked about that had been looted from Southeast Asia uh, is now being returned by big museums. They're, they're now pledging to return it to, to um, Cambodia, which again is a fantastic thing to see. You can have huge impact with these stories. I do think that that the real impact takes time. You know, it takes a while for authorities to absorb the, what they're seeing and then to react to it. We've had requests from more than a dozen countries now for access to the documents. Um, they have told us that they're now investigating actively the revelations. So we have, you know, at least 12 um, investigations in 12 different countries that are going on. You know, my, um, my experience of these kind of investigations, it does take a long time. I mean, we found with Panama Papers, for instance, when we revealed that the Prime Minister of Pakistan had houses in London that he hadn't revealed, it took a year of public protests and court, court cases before he was finally ousted from power and put into jail. You know, that took a whole 12 months. I think you're going to see the same thing here. Yes, it's a it's a long term thing. I I, uh, I have questions, but I would like to read a question from Herwig Höller. I know he works for the Austrian Press Agency. Gerald, did you or did you ever see a risk that certain countries would try to punish in quotes you for your work in a legal way using laws like the Espionage Act or even in an extrajudiciary way, or that big or that big companies might take legal action or a kind that would threaten the existence of ICIJ. Before you reply, I invite everyone now uh, for a Q&A session because we have only 20 minutes left and you're more than welcome to either write in the chat your name and I'll call you and uh, you can turn on your camera and uh, your microphone. Please, Jared. Sure, um, look, I could paper the walls of ICIJ headquarters with the number of legal letters and the legal threats we were getting before we published. So, but again, I know you've all faced that before. So that's not something we, we and it, it's what we have to face in the Western world. It's really our biggest threat It's always legal threat. The reality with, in a lot of countries is that it, they, the journalists face a lot more than that. Before we, again, I'll inside baseball here, before we published, we had five media partners pull out. Um, and they had worked with us all the way through the project. And then two weeks um, before the end, they told us they would not be allowed to publish in their country or their publications would be closed down. I'm not sure that's made, been made public yet, but it eventually will come out. Um, we had a number of reporters who had to leave their countries for their own safety. So again, um, other organizations got involved in that and helping them um, um, so yeah, there's a real, I mean, there's real, there's a real threat. In terms of ICIJ's existence, we are about to be declared a, a, a criminal organization in Russia, uh, which means that if I go to Russia or if any of my team go to Russia, we'll be jailed for six years. I don't intend going to Russia. And, um, you know, I know in the past, the very first story I did on this in 2013, when we published um, what was then known as offshore leaks, which was mainly based around the British Virgin Islands. The British Virgin Islands uh, passed a new law that would have basically put me in jail for doing what I'm doing. But again, you know, I don't feel, I really don't feel under threat. And I think there's a lot of safety in numbers and that there is absolutely no point in trying to go after one journalist when you have 600 reporters and 150 media partners there's a real safety in numbers. And there's also a safety in terms of making sure the story is right, because we all put peer pressure on each other. You know, you're letting everyone know what you're reporting. So everyone else is scrutinizing your reporting. It does lead to a new level of, of accuracy and context for the, for the final story. Uh, are there any other questions or shall I ask? I don't see any hands, but uh, I will... Uh... Everyone, when I said uh, uh, I opened for Q&A, everyone turned off their camera. <laughs> uh, but then I have a question in the meantime. If your partner in Russia uh, is declared uh, either uh, an enemy agency or a foreign agent, they're like extremist uh, agency or, or foreign agent, 
Uh, how would you be doing work in Russia on it's, Russians? It's going to be really hard. We're going to have to work with Russians who have left the country. Um, that, that has happened. Our media partner in this was a, a, an organization called iStories. They have been declared. We, ICIJ hasn't yet, but they have been declared, um, I think, a, a foreign agent in the country. So they, they have to make arrangements to work elsewhere if they want to continue to work as journalists. I mean, these are the people that are really facing threat. You know, again, you know, we all hate getting a legal letter. We all hate having to do with it. It's the bane of our lives. We don't like it. But in reality, you know, we really, um, it's, it's, you know, some people to do journalism really put their lives on the line. Uh, in terms of geographic distribution of your, I may I use the word clients? <laughs> they are not clients. Uh, is there, before I, uh, 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 Roman, please go ahead and introduce yourself and then I'll. Good afternoon. Uh, excuse me. I'm Roman Gerardimos, a professor at Bournemouth University. And um, I also write for a great publication, by the way, Gerard, uh, thank you for all the work you do. You're a role model for everybody and for um, my students as well, I have to say. Um, my question has to do with the engagement of the public with the stories. If you have any, if you could share any thoughts or if you have any data about, um, we've heard in the past that things like, you know, when there, when there are big releases, um, sales of newspapers go up and so on for a while. But generally, do you, do you find that the public interest internationally with, with, uh, in your stories or in the stories that you produce is what you would expect. Um, do you find that certain strategies in terms of communicating um, the key messages work, work better than others? Uh, presumably, the public has a very important role to play in this equation in terms of putting pressure on policymakers, right, to to deal with corruption and so on. Yeah, I mean, in terms of publication, um, we we appear to benefit all of our media partners, and they all tell us about how they have record. I think they. The one figure I've got through, and I've only had one so far from the BBC, is that they've had record numbers of viewers for all of the stories, I think 20 million. So it's a, I think it's the highest um, rating story of the year. Um, so that's um, encouraging. I know that in the past when we've worked with Le Monde, they've told us they've, they've sold a third more newspapers in a day than they would normally sell with some of our stories. So we know we're good. Um, we know, we, you know, people like these kinds of stories because they like to be brought into something I mean, what I think it's really simple. It's it's this is the kind of journalism we ought to be doing, you know. And we've kind of walked away from. It's one of the things that I said earlier that is driving me towards doing it. I just felt that you know, having worked for like twenty five years as a re investigative reporter in the commercial media, I just wasn't getting the sense that they cared about this kind of work anymore. And you know, you'd get dragged off stories after a few months if you weren't getting results. You know, and um, it felt very frustrating. But when I think when you have a great story like this, people care. And also these days with social media, you're able to drive that. A lot of it is unfortunately through social media, not necessarily through the, the main website. But but our, our I mean, we know that we have a huge spike in traffic um, when we have a big publication. But then it, it quickly disappears. I mean, you know, two or three weeks time, our traffic will be down to zero again until we have another publication. So it's a story that's driving it. I, Sorry, I Roman, can I just have a quick follow-up? Sure. Um, so from a sociological perspective, you know, you, I'm sure you've seen all the discussion on like Squid Game and Parasite and like this sort of, this seems to be like inequality, right? And corruption yeah. seems to be yeah. the main point of the 21st century. And like, and, and you know, and these stories are like a manifestation of like the, the problem. Do you feel that is like your instinctive perception that after the, three, especially after the three big releases, that anything was done or enough was done to... Uh, appease like that that public feeling in the world or or that it's like the system is completely like deaf basically you know it, it's a it's a, a good question and difficult to answer i think we got the impression after panama and paradise papers that everything had been fixed we were told by the by the rulers of the world that they had fixed it and they talked about legislation that had been passed um, proposed legislation that never actually got implemented. And so I think the big surprise here was Pandora showing this, the fact that nothing had really changed. Now, I don't know how the public feel about that, but I think for me, the biggest revelation in the Pandora Papers was the hypocrisy of all of these people that had been basically could have fixed the system, should be fixing the system, and they themselves were actually benefiting from it. I'm talking about, you know, 
like the finance minister in Holland, who had been railing for years about offshore secrecy, in particular the British Virgin Islands. And here he is with a company, he has shares in a company in the British Virgin Islands. Or you look at Imran Khan in Pakistan, who'd been swept to power by the Panama Papers. When we published Panama Papers, and the leader at the time was put into jail and Imran Khan came into power. He said, I'm, you know, he was going to have a government where he was going to get rid of this kind of corruption. And yet we we're able to show in the Pandora papers that that all of the people around him, his his water minister, the generals that put him into power, they're all using offshore tax havens and they've all got assets there. Or President Kenyatta in Kenya, who again public figures shouting about transparency, saying that it needs to end. And yet we were able to show that he is using offshore tax havens. And another example is the King of Jordan, you know, who after the, you know, um, people were protesting in the street for, you know, having lack of food, uh, saying that corruption needs to end. And yet here he was using multiple um, offshore tax havens and companies there to buy $100 million worth of property. I mean, it's the blatant hypocrisy. You know, Tony Blair, I mean, Tony Blair of all people getting up in Parliament, getting elected, saying that there, there were two different rules, one for the rich, one for the poor. And here he was buying an off, a company that was owned by uh, an offshore tax haven and saving 300,000 UK pounds in doing it. Now, he didn't do anything wrong. And again, I think this was important to point out because people always say to me, but this is all legal. They're not doing anything illegal. Tony Blair didn't do anything illegal, but he was the prime minister of a country and he was a, he's basically not paying taxes in that country. And he knew what he was doing. You know, so it's the blatant hypocrisy of our leaders that I think is the biggest story that's come out here. So basically, they all said it was fixed. We're showing it again as journalists you know what, it's not fixed, it's worse than ever. And I think that's the kind of journalism you have to do. You've got to be relentless on these topics if you really want to get change. Sorry, I'm you, on my uh, soapbox. But, Vivian yeah. Wu, uh, yeah. since I like when people ask direct questions, Vivian, would you like to ask or shall I read from the, uh, Vivian? Oh. Hi, 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 hi. It's Please really introduce uh, it's like, yourself, Vivian. I know you, but hi. the others don't. Yeah, uh, Vivian Wu. Um, I'm currently the head of BBC Chinese in Hong Kong and uh, the Hong Kong Bureau. Um, but maybe next month I'll I'll leave the BBC and look for other projects. So just yeah. But uh, my question is, um, uh, you you mentioned actually you're still doing the projects on Russia, even though. It's quite difficult for you to operate inside Russia. Um, how about China? Actually, uh, while I was li listening to you, I was talking to some of the friends, uh, some of Chinese native uh, journalists who used to work in some outlets you, you might be familiar with. Um, the, the question is what the situation uh, for, for the journalist to really check on the stories related to China? Um, or basically it's in totally impossible because China is becoming even more uh, you know, mysterious and frightening than Russia. So what the situation? And uh, we also know there are some outlets um, or some institutes in Hong Kong that have to uh, have worked with you, um, uh, but what, what the situation now? So is it getting even more uh, frustrating? Sorry to bring up this question. Because no, no. I've been working this field for years, so I really want to see what was what's your update. Yeah, thanks. It was very difficult to. There were a, quite a number of um, Chinese names in the documents. We actually had a one of the service providers was based in Hong Kong, so we had particular information there. Another one was based in, um, you know, two were based in Hong Kong. Um, yeah, so we we did bring um, Chinese. We did bring Hong Kong media partner into this. We also brought in. Uh, and somebody who had worked in China, but really we left most of it behind. We we you know we saw names there we thought could be interesting, but how we work and and the and this is the the strength but also the weakness of the ICIJ model. You need local media partners to work with you, and you really need them to work with you all the way through the project because we're not experts. I, I mean, I could see something, think it's of interest, but really not have that local knowledge, and so we um, did not succeed. In China, there's a lot of names in there that may be a story. Again, I don't know if it's a story until someone looks at it, you don't know. And that is, again, the, I could say the weakness and the strength of the model. If you can get committed journalists to look at the documents, you're likely to find a story in there. So we found um, 
we published something called China Leaks a few years ago in 2014, and we were banned in China after that. And we found it very difficult to work in China from that moment on because, um, you know, nobody really wanted to take a risk working with us. We had worked out a way of, of, of doing it then, but it's, it's become really difficult um, in the last four or five years in particular. Um, so, uh, I, yeah, basically it, there are some parts of the world you wish you could do more in, but you'd also don't want to put journalists at risk, you know, and I did yeah. approach journalists all the way through saying, are you interested in doing this? And we had offers of help, but I found that these offers of help did not um, lead to anything. In other words, and again, I wasn't going to push them because I, you know, you don't know what risks they face if they do help you. Thanks. Thanks, really, for the frank answer. But we can keep discussing this because uh, sure. the contrast is uh, the issue about China is so important and uh, getting more and more important. But on the contrast, we see the journalistic work actually is a, is a fading off uh, the, the field, which is a huge gap. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. I, can, I, can, I can say with some, cert, uh, with some certainty that, that Chinese politicians are the same as every other politician. They are using the offshore world to hide money and to take money out of China. And, and it's, it's the same pattern we're looking at from almost every country in the world. They're no different to anybody else. They are doing it. But proving it is another thing. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you very much. Georg, thank you, Vivian. Thanks. Georg, please go ahead. Unmute yourself. No, it works. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed for this most fascinating uh, Presentation. Um, I'm from uh, please introduce yourself. Introduce I'm yourself. from the Institute of the Danube Region, Central Europe, and I have a question concerning Turkey because uh, seem, things seem not to be so well over there, and I wonder about local partners. Do you have experiences, uh, and how how uh, is the development actually? Thank you. Thank you so much, Georg. Uh, Jared, uh, I will read one question because a colleague wrote that his camera doesn't work. And oh, uh, so. I, I put it on. Okay. No, no, not yours, another oh, colleague. Okay. Uh, it is uh, Javier Roque from International Press Institute. So, uh, first question, Georg, and the second question, I'll put them together. We have only eight minutes left. Is um, what has been the biggest challenge or obstacle that ICIJ has faced during the investigative work? For Pandora Papers. So first Turkey and then um, the biggest challenge. Look, Turkey is a country we do work in. We do have a media partner there and they were actively writing stories about this. So it's not impossible to work in Turkey, but it is difficult because again, if you're working in an environment where the journalist is under threat, our media um, partner there who's an ICIJ member was actually threatened with jail for one of our previous projects. And in fact, it was only recently that she was um, uh, the, the judge said she didn't have to go to jail, which was a relief. It was only months into the into the actual, this actual project. So again, it's another country where journalists face particular threats. And again, it's very important for us to judge, not to push too hard, because we cannot force them to do things that will eventually. We, you know, none of us want to be responsible for putting somebody in jail or encouraging them to do something that will put them in danger. But you know, but they are adults and they can take their own decisions and. This reporter is very brave. She still works with us. Um, she did find things in the in, you know, she did publish stories because I've seen her on Twitter as well talking about those stories. So, not impossible yet to work in Turkey, but one of those countries I think is under threat. Um, the biggest um, biggest threat we had was really the more people you tell about the story, the more danger you have that it'll get out. And as the project became bigger and bigger. I mean, we had 600 reporters and 115 different countries, 150 media partners. It's not just the 600 reporters that you have to worry about. It's the fact that they tell somebody usually and, you know, and, and the casualness that could happen. Um, near the end, we always go to um, the people we're about to name weeks and weeks in advance because that is the American system. You want to give everyone a chance to comment and you want to be able to put um, context around everything. I mean, I keep talking about context because it's actually really important for us from a, um, a legal point of view in the US. If you can get as much context around a story, it's actually really difficult for someone to sue you afterwards. And I know that a lot of, you know, I worked in Australia for many years. I worked in Ireland. It's almost impossible to publish anything about anybody because you're going to end up getting sued, even if you're not saying anything bad. The beauty about working in America is that if you can get your story right, if the story is accurate, 
and you put proper context around it, it's really, really hard for anyone to sue you. And even if you do get it wrong, as long as you've got the context and you've given them a chance to respond, again, it's very difficult to sue. So it's a really good environment because of the First Amendment to work in, which is why we're based in the US. And um, yeah, I mean, but again, with that comes a lot of danger. Um, we found this time that world leaders were able to respond in ways that really threw us um, because in the past they didn't know how to react and they, you know, but this time around they seem to have have hired PR firms and they were so well polished by the time we published. Like President Kenyatta of Kenya came out and said, oh, we just published a story showing, if, well, you know, if I can go so far as to say that he's, you know, certainly corrupt or at least suggesting the corruption. And yet he came out and said, I welcome the transparency in this reporting. Uh, we published a story about Imran Khan and his government that I thought would bring down potentially the government. And again, Imran Khan came out and said, we welcome the transparency. It was almost as if they're all reading from the same script. You know, and he even then said that this was really a story about colonialism and it needed to be you know, a, a topic that needed to be tackled globally and all the right things. I mean, he, he couldn't have scripted it better and he's still in power and nothing's happened. Um, yeah, it was just like, yeah, I, I don't know, maybe, Maybe people are starting to work out ICIJ. They know how we work now. They know that we've got methodology and they're all getting better at answering. I mean, these people, some of them should probably be facing um, impeachment or something in their countries, but they're not. I mean, some of them are, but many more of them should be, in uh, my opinion. Yeah. I wonder, Jared, uh, and when we were, uh, had a conversation before this event, I told you uh, that a colleague from Hungary uh, commented once that a lot of citizens cannot imagine the scope of corruption that is going on around the uh, Orban government. People understand 1,000 euros, 2,000 euros, and your revelations are trillions. Yes. So it is so far away from average person, uh, even to imagine this amount of money. I wonder if it is easier to do PR work around it. Yeah, and also the fact that they have so much money, they can afford lawyers and, and PR firms and other things. I mean, yeah, it, it is hard to imagine some of the looting that's going on. I mean, it's, it is hundreds of millions of dollars that, we're, that we were looking at coming out of particularly poor countries into wealthy countries. And that also raises another issue about the responsibility of the wealthy countries, because it is, it is England and the US. I mean, we've, we found that it, particularly the US has now become the biggest tax haven in the world. Why? Because the US has been cracking down on other countries and, and scolding other countries for doing things. They've been scolding Switzerland, they've been scolding the British Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, and, and also forcing um, anyone who's got a, an American passport to, to you know, reveal their riches around the world, which has made a lot of people really nervous dealing with anybody who's American. So the solution is that they're now all going to America and they're opening up um, offshore accounts in places like South Dakota. Uh, and which is, you know, again, it's a race to the bottom now in the US and the various US states. Um, and again, I think, you know, with London, you know, um, the British government should be doing much more and have promised to do. Um, David Cameron, when he was prime minister, said that he was going to make all offshore tax havens, the British um, dependencies, you know, have open um, registers of all of the offshore companies. It still hasn't happened. A lot of the things that he promised have never happened. And you've got to ask yourself why. And it's because, again, we're seeing here, the money is flowing into the city of London. It's, it's driving up house prices in London for ordinary citizens. But it, And then one of the biggest um, stories that came out of it from a British point of view was a lot of the money that's propping up the Boris Johnson government, the Conservative Party, is dirty money coming from Russia. And they published that story. And I thought there would be outrage in Britain about it. And I just did a panel yesterday with um, a British um, Labour MP and, and she was just expressing how, you know, she couldn't believe that the ordinary people are not worried about this. I mean, it is literally dirty money being donated to the Conservative Party and no one is saying a word. And it's, it's really because London is now being propped up by this offshore world. Uh, it's where all the dirty money is going and it's what's keeping London rich. So there's no incentive for the British government to do anything about it.
uh, a colleague from Moscow calls London, Londongrad, but uh, yeah. uh, there is just one very short question and uh, we shall, uh, a, a colleague, Alexander, Alexander asks, uh, what can, uh, how can an independent freelance journalist uh, uh, join you? Uh, it's difficult because I, when I'm building this, I deliberately went to publications because I want platforms. You know, I, I and I'm, I apologize about this because it is actually difficult to work with this unless you've worked with this before. Um, you can apply for membership of ICIJ. I have set up a committee of ICIJ members who decide on membership. So I don't do that anymore because I didn't want to be directly involved in it. I, I you know, so you again, go to our website. Um, you get recommended by ICIJ members to be a member if you want to be. That's a good way to work with. Another great way to work with this is come to me with a story that's global. Um, and you could be at the center of some one of these things, you know, I mean, you would be the star. And, um, you know, we have repeatedly done this with other journalists that have come to us. If it's a, but it's got to be a really good story that is of, of interest to somebody in France, somebody in Brazil, you know, and therefore, you know, um, yeah, but, 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 you know, good ideas are like, they're like gold, you know. Well, uh, our time is up. Jared, I want to thank you so much for sharing uh, all your thoughts and uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the information talking about your work. I would all, uh, I, we shall, I shall send to everybody who was present again, the link to donations. And I would also like to tell you that if you ever need our platform, you will always uh, have it for Central Europe, for Europe, and as you have seen also for Hong Kong, we do have, uh, uh, we are well connected here uh, uh, in uh, Central Europe and in Vienna. I thank you so much and I thank uh, everybody for joining us today. And I hope that uh, Jared has inspired you to keep working as a journalist because journalist real, uh, journalism matters because democracy matters. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.